Hi, this is Dr. Marshall, and if you're watching this video, uh, it is the first video in the second part of the 1-1 uh, classifying matter assignment for chemistry. Uh, and I'm assuming that you got here by going to home and then going to assignments and clicking on the classifying matter assignment and coming up with a worksheet and then clicking on the Nearpod presentation and open the screen and welcome and so we've previously in this discussion talked about the features of matter itself uh, and the properties of matter we defined matter as anything that has mass and volume and because we define this term using two other terms we also need to go and define those two other terms as well so we also defined and described mass and we defined and described volume and uh, talked about the units that we're going to use and then we uh, also uh, said that there's an important property of matter uh, called density that is the amount of mass in a volume of space uh, and we saw a couple examples of things that we could do with it uh, we uh, found the density of a, a known uh, substance and uh, looked it up and uh, used uh, uh, that value as a, a reference to find what the substance was and we also worked a, a problem uh, involving a situation in the real world with a, a a density. So now that we have at least a vague idea of what matter is, we extend our organizational chart to the uh, matter has properties that undergoes changes uh, parts of it. So this forms the core of our organizational chart. We have uh, matter and matter has properties that undergoes changes. As we've already seen with the building blocks of our graphic organizer, or the building of our graphic organizer and I'm going to open up the notes thing here so I can type in answers um, as we've already seen uh, the first step in talking about matter after we define it is to recognize that it has both physical and chemical properties okay and these are the things that we use to identify or describe certain substances right and we also know that uh, these substances undergo physical and chemical changes we have defined physical properties as those properties that are present without uh, the substance actually changing or interacting chemically with another substance. So, for example, uh, I have water in the solid state. That's a physical property. Uh, a chemical property of hydrogen, on the other hand, would be that it can combine with oxygen to form water. It has the ability to do that. So that's a, a chemical property. Uh, it has the ability to do something chemically. Okay, so now we know that matter has properties and again it undergoes physical and chemical changes. And we define physical changes as are changes that occur when the substance is altered in its physical properties, but not its chemical composition. So if I change from a solid to a liquid, that's a change in a physical property because it's still water, it's still H2O. On the other hand, if I break the oxygen-hydrogen bonds in water molecules, I change the substance chemically from water to hydrogen and oxygen molecules. Okay, so those are important definitions. So in order for us to really understand the concepts of properties and changes, we have to understand 
why substances have these properties. What is it about these substances that give rise to their specific properties? And uh, to start, I want to uh, do a little drawing here. Uh, and I'm going to go to a blank uh, uh, drawing page here and I want to draw five water molecules and I want to do it like this I want to draw one water molecule in the center with the oxygen up like this and then I'm going to from each of these I'm going to from this oxygen I'm going to draw a dotted line and then I'm going to draw another water mole water molecule at that side of it dotted line draw another water molecule over here, dotted line, attach another water molecule here, and dotted line, attach another water molecule here. Okay, so I've got these five water molecules, and individually they're water molecules, and I'm just going to draw little spaces around them so we can see the more definitively here like this. And yes, I want this drawing on your worksheet and so let's go back to our our screen we've um, created this uh, drawing here and you should have it sitting in front of you now so let's ask some questions about it or, or make some statements about it um, you've got this drawing again and uh, if you're watching this in class you you can see it up on the board um, so Notice that we've drawn dotted lines between the particles of water, and I've, I've asked you what you think these dotted lines represent, and, and hopefully it makes sense that these represent forces of attraction. Okay, the water molecules are attracted to each other because we've said that water is polar and near the oxygen end it's a little bit more negative and near the hydrogen end it's a little bit more positive and each water molecule exerts a force of attraction on each other they pull each other together because of this uh, and we use a dotted line because the dotted line uh, means that this force is not quite as strong as a chemical bond, okay? The chemical bond is between the uh, oxygen and hydrogen atoms in the water molecules themselves, but these forces are between the water particles, not inside the water particles. So we could ask the question, what effect do you think the strength of these has on the form of matter of the water and so what we're going to say is if the matter if the uh, forces are stronger it's more likely that the form of matter is a solid right the stronger these forces are these interparticle forces are the stronger these forces between the particles are the more likely it is that this substance is a solid so what we're going to say is the stronger these forces the more likely the state of matter is a solid okay the stronger the forces the more likely the state of matter is a solid now because these forces are between particles we're going to say that they are inter particle forces Okay, forces between the particles. That's what inter means. Inter means between the particles, so between the particle forces. And we could ask ourselves what rule we could come up with to describe the relationship between these forces and the state of matter. Okay, this doesn't just have to be for water. This could be for any particles of any substance. We're going to find out that all particles of substances have forces of attraction but in some these some substances these forces of attraction are weaker some they're stronger so for example things that are gases at room temperature have very weak inner particle forces and they uh, require 
uh, uh, chilling to very low temperatures in order to get them to turn into a liquid or a solid before those par inner particle forces can take hold. So what we're going to say here is, in general, in general, if inter particle forces are weak, the state of matter is most likely to be gaseous. If intermediate, liquid and if strong solid okay so we're going to say that for any substance in general what the state of matter is is going to depend on how strong the forces of attraction are between the particles okay so that's what i mean when i say we need to figure out why we have these changes of state what what causes these changes of state and it's going to be the strength of the forces of attraction now here's an even more important question in terms of understanding theory in general what would we have to know about the nature of matter for this rule to be true. In order for us to say that there are interparticle forces that cause these forces of attract or that cause these states of matter to, to be present, what would we have to know about matter in general to have interparticle forces? I must have, and hopefully you can think of it uh, as being we need to have matter made of particles. All matter must be made of particles. Okay, so this was a huge leap for science in general, the understanding that all matter is made of particles. In order for there to be interparticle forces, in order for there to be changes of state, matter has to be made of particles. And we didn't know that until about 1800. We might have suspected it. And in fact, the uh, early Greek societies uh, in, in 400 or 500 BC uh, reasoned that they thought that things were made of tiny indivisible particles and they named those atoms uh, but they didn't know we didn't really have the the theory in place until about 1800 okay so this was an important thing the understanding uh, that matters made of particles is a very important point okay um, I'm just trying to see how close I am to running out of time here So why don't we stop this video and go to the next video. And I think we're probably going to end up with three videos instead of two here. So, so let's stop this one and we'll go to the next one, okay?